Hi, good evening, and welcome to this webinar titled The Global Impact of the UI Act, a Brussels Side Effect. I'm Laura Ferrari, I'm the Digital Marketing Manager at Modulus, and today I will introduce our speakers. Then at the end, if you have some questions, please write your questions in the chat, and then I will ask them to the speakers. So let's introduce our speakers. Today we have Marco Almada, welcome Marco, and Kevin Savitsky. Welcome, Kevin. So, Marco Almada is a researcher in the Academic Scholarship Program on Innovation Research and Expertise at the European University Institute. He works on the limits of technology neutral approaches to artificial intelligence regulation. He also obtained professional experience in technology regulation and data science in Brazil. And he completed degrees in law and computer science. Instead, Kevin, Kevin, is, Kevin Shamisky is the co-founder and CEO of Modulus. He is currently driving the mission to develop and operate AI products and services in a new regulated environment. He's deeply engaged in crafting and championing responsible and trustworthy AI solutions. Uh, I know, Kevin, that you also have um, a work experience in the academic field, but since we don't have a, a lot of time, I give you just a short introduction of the speakers, but please feel free to add more information about yourself. And Marco, you know, I know that you're a researcher and I know that you want to start with your recent publication on AI regulations. So uh, if you're ready, you can share the screen and start with your publication and then we will move on to the sure. discussion. Thank you, Laura, for this introduction. And I will briefly speak about this paper because it will give us a bit of a conversation starter for this discussion. Because uh, so, this is a paper that I have written with a colleague from the also from the European University Institute, which is called Ankaratu. And in this paper, we look at precisely the proposal for a European AI Act and how it is likely to influence regulation around the globe, because. A few years ago, when the GDPR came into force, we all saw that even countries that even businesses that are not based in the European Union had to adapt their practices to ensure that they are complying with European requirements, even though they are not, even in cases when they are not legally obliged to do so. And even some countries had changed their laws to accommodate and to become closer to the European standard of regulation. This is in part the result of what is usually called the Brussels effect, which is an influence that the European Union exercises in regulation because it is a big market with lots of regulatory capability and that tends to adopt strict laws. And because of these and other factors, whatever the EU creates as law tends to influence, have a good, a strong influence across the globe. And there is a big question of whether the AI Act would have the same effect, whether it would influence regulation across the globe. And in our paper, we basically argue that this effect is likely to come, but because the AI Act relies so strongly on technical standards and on technical norms to regulate AI, the kinds of things that are going to be propagated are mostly technical requirements. The, the, those requirements are what is going to influence the law of other jurisdictions. But the European Union had broader ambitions for the regulatory. If you go to the commission documents they released beforehand, they released in 2020, 2021, various strategies on what they wanted to do in AI regulation, they all had this ambition of setting European values. And the text of the AI Act speak of protecting fundamental rights and then democracy, the rule of law, and various other factors. But because what is going to spread about the AI Act is likely those technical requirements those requirements that will spread are not likely to cover those fuzzier values that the European regulation tends to protect. So while the European Union might succeed in pro propagating its rules for artificial intelligence, that success alone might not be enough to achieve the policy aims they want to create and protection of fundamental rights and so on. And for this, I will end here the presentation, but Laura will share with you a link for the paper in case you want to learn more. And from now on, we move forward. Yeah, I will share the link on the chat. So I think we can start with the discussion. 
Okay, great. Well, it's it's really fantastic to have you here, Marco. I have a, a, an, a legal scholar who is also a data scientist working on AI law. So that's a, this is a, a very rare and uh, unique combination of, of skills and expertise these days. Um, let, let's start with just this Brussels effect and dive a, a little bit deeper into what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I know it's it, it is somewhat of a buzzword, but uh, let's dive into why an American company say would care about GDPR? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Kevin, because we, as we have seen, lots of uh, corporate, lots of countries are proposing their own regulations. The US are trying to do their thing. The United Kingdom also, Brazil is also doing various other countries around the world. So why should we care about European Union specifically, especially if you're not providing services with our products within the EU? This is, there are various factors that make this influence grow first. Because, first, because if you want to do business in the European Union, you are bound to follow the laws of the European Union. That is usually one requirement for entry into the market. And this is one thing that's presented in the AI Act in the way it's constructed. It is meant to say, to establish conditions in which you need to follow to place into the European market AI products and services. But the Brussels effect goes beyond that. It says that even if you don't want to come into the European Union, you are likely to deal with requirements that are shaped by what the European Union adds to this law. And why is that? First, because since you, even if you're not coming to the European Union market, so many providers are coming to the EU and do not, so they must adjust their products to meet with local requirements, especially because those requirements tend to be quite technical because you have lots of regulatory capacity in the sense that you have institutions that can develop technical requirements and so on. And they tend to develop stringent uh, requirements. That is, if you have laws in the European Union, they tend to be demand more than the lighter touch re requirements that other jurisdictions set up, or at least so. So if you are a business trying to come into the European Union or a competitor of such a business, you have the choice of I'm not whether avoiding the European Union altogether or complying with those stringent requirements. And because those requirements are so stringent, usually when you comply with them, that tends to be enough to give you more, to get closer to compliance with the other laws. But if your products are not really divisible, if you're dealing with things like large AI systems that are not worthwhile retraining just for the European market, but the European market is still attractive, you are not going to be, you're likely to spread those requirements from European Union, even in contexts where they are not strictly needed. You could do with that, but because it's so expensive to do otherwise, you are not going to, you're going to have the same standards everywhere in the world, even if you theoretically could do it different. And once those standards spread out, there is some pressure towards uh, regulation in other countries because business might benefit from having uniform regulation throughout the world whenever it's possible. So not only some of those large international business have incentives to comply with European law, even when they are not nominally obliged to do so, they have incentives to push for the expansion of those standards. And this is not really something novel because it's been, this has been happening in various sectors with product regulation, with chemicals and so on. And it's been a particularly strong phenomenon when it comes to the GDPR, like when we saw all, the, all those data protection laws that appeared around the world, even in the US, which is traditionally so light-handed in regulation, they have, the California laws have been strongly influenced by the GDPR, the laws of various other countries, even if they don't go all the way, they tend to pick concepts and ideas from what European Union has done. So this is why it ends up being such a big influence all around the world. So this is there's lots of points to uh, to uh, pursue further here. So one of the most interesting things that happens over the last say a couple couple of months or even in the last couple of weeks is that we've had the executive order from President Biden in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, we now have an, a law introduced uh, uh, just recently in the U.K. Parliament with mm -hmm. the moves in Brazil uh, and also just in the last few days uh, California is working on a sort of an equivalent to the AI Act. So let, let's take this idea of the Brussels effect, which, uh, of course, 
um, was observed, I think, I think was coined even for GDPR, where Europe set this massive law and then everyone followed. Now we're in a different situation. So the AI Act isn't even finished yet. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, the, the trilogues is still ongoing. Uh, the, things could still change. Um, but everyone is already proposing how they want to do things, uh, how the United States want to do it, uh, how the UK wants to do it. Uh, how is this going to work? So will we still be able to talk about a Brussels effect here at all? Or is it a free for all? Well, this is a this is the big the trillion dollar question we might say here, given that there are so many uncertainties, like even though, for example, the AI Act itself, as you mentioned, it's not really as defined as one would expect, given all those recent controversies with large law with the regulation of large models and so on. But I would say that the current facts we have on the ground suggest that the answer is neither here nor there. We're not going to have a full Brussels effect in the sense that the European Union will be the sole rule maker here. But at the same time, it is still going to be a big influence on whatever comes out. Because if you go and look at the text of the British proposal, It Mm -hmm. is not an AI act. They go all the way to say it's not the AI act, but even then it draws from lots of concepts. It is informed by lots of the discussions that have been made on critiques of the AI act. So you see lots of concepts that are shared. And even the American proposal, if you go look at what Biden proposes in this executive order, there are many things that are very different because the US do their things and their rules in a way that's lots of difference, but they are technically basically the same problems that many of the same problems you're trying to create uh, information requirements for large language models and other foundation models you're trying to avoid casting them into a too tough uh, requirement framework but keep it keep the tag of the developing capabilities of those models and so on and when you look at how those structures are implemented there are some parallels so To an extent, since the discussion in Europe uh, has started so early on, you can see that when you look at the text, there are various things that even though the terms change a bit, they can be quite similar, even when you don't have to do that. For example, the Brazilian law is lots of human rights and and so on, but it still draws a lot from the high-risk classification model. I I was going to say that because the the EU early on chose to take a risk-based approach, so not... A, a, a technology approach or a use case approach, but really a risk approach. And, and my impression is that that seems to have been almost implicitly adopted by, by everyone else. Did, am I correct in that? Yeah, it, it seems very rare to see any proposal elsewhere that appears that you have things that complement risk measures, for example, even in the EU, you have the proposal of the liability directives, you have the product liability directive being changed, and then you have a specific directive on liability for AI, which relates to how things are proved for establishing liability. Those other laws tend to discuss also those mechanisms, but they all see those things as building up on the idea that you have AI systems, they create risks, and those risks are of a certain kind. And so you require the developers of AI systems to address those risks. If those systems are high risk, you have to do more things. If those systems are not high risk, you have to adopt more specific measures. But Basically, this seems the direction that everybody on the Western world is taking. I would not say about China necessarily, though they are addressing some kind of risks mm-hmm. with strong measures. So it's also not like they're doing, entire, even they are not doing entirely different from what's been going on. So if if, if you and I were like a developer and a lawyer in a, in a company that that builds fantastic AI models and 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 our boss says like, make sure we, we can ship this model in as many countries and as many markets as as possible. How, what what will we do? What will we be talking about? What measures will we be taking to make sure that Mm -hmm. we could legally deploy it in as many places as possible, maybe with as few technical, expensive technical changes as possible? Where would we start? Yeah, here's the the start. This is one of the reasons why the, even though various countries are trying different things, the AI Act might, well, which is precisely because it offers this kind of roadmap you can follow for assessing risks. It requires you to 
First, assess the risks that can emerge from your particular application, which is something that requires a kind of forecasting exercise, which is not something that is solely a technical discussion, but so you need to get the technical stakeholders on the table with legal, with all those kinds of other actors that might understand the consequence of going on. And once you have on that, the you have various sets of requirements that have been appearing on those various regulations, even if different forms. You have requirements regarding extensive technical documentation of your processes. You have requirements regarding the need to metrify, adopt, adopt robust metrics for determining accuracy, evaluating the, evaluating the fairness of your models and cybersecurity. And all of those measures are things that can be documented beforehand and you can rely on established practices to tackle. So it's a thing that requires new, sol new solutions to address in a more systematic way. But much of that work, much of what has been proposed in terms of best practices is can be translated from various jurisdictions. So that already provides a starting point, even though many, if, and so if you look at those kinds of standards that are starting to emerge, you are going to be in a position that allows you to minimize the need for extensive rework, but you need to look at that from, at an early stage of the yeah. development process, I would say. So uh, the process, the development process, the the best practices, the, mm -hmm. the documentation, the, the risk management, the, the structure looks very similar across the world. And then if you want, I, I, I don't want to say the, uh, the, the content, the, the, the details, those are adapted to different countries. So um, which kind of reminds me the argument that your paper makes and brings me to my next question. So the AI Act itself, actually, it doesn't use the word fairness very often. It mm -hmm. has some places where it refers to fundamental rights. Um, but of course, what, what's a fundamental right and what's, uh, what's a, a civil right in the United States it, are very different. And so if I'm not the engineer, okay, I'm going to have two versions. Uh, it's basically the same system. And in, in the EU, I'm going to have a, a slightly different approach to, to what fairness or fundamental rights means. And in the US version, yeah, I, I have different considerations and I'd have to think about disparate impact or, or certain mm -hmm. court decisions. But this, the, the structure, the workflow on, on the engineering side looks very similar. Is, is, is that kind of your argument? And that's also why in your paper you said, yeah, the, the AI might succeed in exporting the, the structures, but not the values. Yes, precisely because of that. Because once you have you have these very differences that they hurt in terms of the content, they, that they are likely to demand localization, a substantial localization work once you get to the content of that. Exactly how you measure discrimination, because this is an issue that appears that, as you mentioned, disparate impact is a concept that appears a lot in the technical scholarship on fairness and fair algorithms, but it does not really match that well to EU law conceptions of discrimination, as Sandra Wachter and others have argued. And so you have those things that the contents will differ. So this is why it's not like once you have a procedure is all solved, but the procedures, the kind of, since as we, we are discussing, all those kinds of risks, we are considering diff, similar risks that emerge from those technologies are being considered by all those regulations. Having established procedures for tackle also facilitates not just compliance with a specific legislation, but how to, but also identifying what kinds of expertise can be trans, translated and transported from one context to the other, and what might require new new work to address. Mm -hmm. So by moving the by setting out this plot line that cannot be applied to the others, the EU ends up being the first mover. In, the, in this competition for regulation. So I'm gonna drill down a little bit more of this question of, of fairness and, and, and mm -hmm. bias and, and discrimination. So if, if again, if you, if, you, if you were the lawyer advising the data scientists in a company today, uh, how should they think about these concepts and, and what, should they, what should they be doing? And, and I am asking this from a position of, I know these are mostly unresolved questions, like how mm -hmm. do we translate law to uh to to an algorithm right because that's not how laws are written um and and i'm assuming here that many of the the, the regulatory agencies in the us and and the 
the the the regulators in, in Europe, they're they're gonna have some some degree of um, you know leniency in this early period where these things are being uh, clarified. Um, maybe in the spirit of as long as you're doing a, a good effort to try and mitigate them, may, maybe the, it's a, it's okay. Or how do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is um, indeed is something that, as you said, is something that's not really tackled from the technical side. You have lots of open questions on how to tackle that. So the first thing that um, a lawyer might advise here would be to make sure that to use those opportunities that for dialogue that appear in the regulation, for example, when sandboxes emerge, the, the AI Act has lots of talk about setting up regulatory sandboxes to evaluate how those things can evaluate in practice, precisely because they must, you have, must test those conditions into, into safe environments, otherwise it might be exposing you to a lot, or your company to lots of risks and liability that could otherwise be avoided, especially because since you have lots of problems that are not really solved, there it will involve some procedure of un understanding what compromises are acceptable, okay, what metrics are. And one recommendation that would come here is to avoid, uh, to try and avoid path dependency here on the technical side of things, because not only the technical questions about how do we metrify fairness, how, what metrics should we look at, and what dimensions should we look are open. But you also have lots of discussions regarding the legal side of this thing. So you need, not only is this a conversation that you need to have the, the legal people involved as early as possible in this process, and here's where one another thing where having structured processes and practice and so on will help a lot, but you also need to be aware of that those things that those established facts on how to tackle algorithmic discrimination, how to ensure that your algorithms are fair, the goalpost might be post might be moving quite a bit here. So it's not like you're going to have a solution that sets you for a far future, but you might require some reworking here. And if you manage to detach that, make sure that the rework occurs at a higher level of abstraction, something that demands less effort for your company, you'll probably be better positioned to tackle this kind of issue. By the way, if you if you have questions for, for Marco, please uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm going to impose more, more on his time. Um, one um, question about fairness that um, usually opens the discussion that I have with people is, is a simple distinction between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. And, and the first thing that, that many people are actually surprised by is that, that not, not only can you measure that, you can mm -hmm. quantify it, but that you can deliberately change a model, an AI model, to steer it towards one or the other. And then the question immediately comes, well, what's right? What's What does the law want me to do? And, and there I've already pushed you on it. But then the, the second question that comes along, and people start to reflect on well, what are my values? What, which one do I, what, what do I actually prefer? And and that's usually the opening to a really interesting discussion. So um, putting on the spot here, what, what do you prefer, equality of opportunity or equality of outcome? Well, it's it depends quite a bit on on this sense. Like with this a kind of thing that where uh, trade offs for equality of opportunity. I, I would say that if you have a a good baseline of equality of material equality and so on, then you can afford to have more risk taking, you can afford to have more situations in which you have opportun opportunities open to all and leave them to takers. But it all depends on, okay, what baseline are we talking about here? Because mm -hmm. otherwise you might find a situation where um, Russian rule basically um, ran throwing everything to randomness might not be as desirable as one what I I particularly would would be a bit a bit risk averse on that front, but not too much because if you are too risk averse, then you do not get to, you do not get uh, opportunity to innovate and solve problems that are thought as unshakable and so on. So it goes back to this question of uh, exporting values um, mm -hmm. again. Let, 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 let's speculate a little bit here. Obviously, again, the AI Act's not done. Everyone is cooking their their own law. 
in your paper, you were skeptical that the EU would be able to export its values very much with the, the AI Act. Um, given all that's happened, uh, the, these rapid developments, do, do you still think that's the case? Or has the door opened again, maybe a little bit? Mm. I think that it, it strengthens our my, my our original point in that sense, because now that, that people are going to tackle the, all, all those jurisdictions are coming up with their own visions of what it means to regulate AI. We have seen, oh, we have variations on a theme. Everybody's seeing that AI causes risks and we must address it. But then we face various differences. Okay, what matters when we are facing those risks? This question you just asked me about equality of opportunity and equality of conditions is also something that varies highly according to their position society according to different jurisdictions. And this is something that comes out very strongly on the on those discussions of why, why people tend to talk about why you innovate more on U, the US than in the EU, why there is this stereotype. There is a stereotype that, oh, this happens because of regulation, this happens because of cultural values. N neither here nor there, but you do have some differences on okay, what is seen as priority, what is seen as relevance by each jurisdiction that I and th in this sense when the US proposes stringent regulation for example you have uh, this tendency to have a competition you can see that you can pick, pick an European like model and not bring European values into the fold but mm -hmm. on the other hand you have proposals such as for example China had initialized initially proposed uh the initial draft of Chinese regulations was said that they wanted to emphasize embedding Chinese values into models. This is always, when you say embedding values, political values into models, you always create the preoccupation of how those values, what happens if those values change or what happens if those values are applied to other societies. And this is such a complex question that if you look at the latest versions of the Chinese proposals for regulation, this has been watered down somewhat mm -hmm. so it's it shows that it can be very very difficult to export values even if you're actively trying to do so even especially when you have other sets of values trying to get range to mm -hmm. so i saw that we have a question in the chat so is it okay if we move on to the q a okay so the question is quite long. So and the question is, does natural law theory with its assertion of fund fundamental principles of justice and morality inherent in nature and discoverable through reason pose significant challenges when applied to the regulation of AI in common law countries? So particularly in the absence of expli explicit written regulations, Mm. This seems uh, this is a very good question because it all goes to the to the heart of the question here in terms of values. Because when you're saying that okay, so you have natural law theory, which as the person who asked this question pointed out, is you have the idea that you have principles of justice and morality inherent in na nature, and those principles are what exact the true law, even if the positive law goes against that, the idea that if you have a law that is unjust, then it's not law at all. So this gives you uh, the possibility of cl a clash to, with, between what might be those natural law, not those rules of natural law versus what is actually codified. This is a, a problem that might emerge when you're dealing with those systems. But then if you're going to say, oh, I would just implement natural law principles, whatever they might be, you get you are simply changing the question of how do I implement uh, part? How do I interpret a complex piece of European Union law or a complex piece of U.S. law into a question? How do I identify those values that are that are emerged that are the natural true law, and how do I handle conflicts between those So I think that it can be a challenge. It can it poses various levels of challenge. First, the idea that if you try to develop systems with natural law, you're probably going to have some conflicts with positive law of certain jurisdictions, depending on how that natural law is interpreted. And also the, the classic problems of under, 
all the problems about natural law that have been appearing on the legal philosophy. I'm not saying with this, do not go the natural law way, but I would say that this is not a so say, saying natural law is not in itself a solution to the kinds of problems we have discussed. You are still going to need to tackle all those kinds of procedures, but you are essentially plugging a different set of values into this rather than plugging EU law values or something else. Okay, thank you, Marco. Um, let's see if we have another question, but I don't think so. So I don't know if you want to say something more. If not, uh, I think we are done for today. Uh, Kevin, would you like to add something? I would have to say that. Well, I think it was a really interesting discussion. And what, what crystallized for me is this idea that actually the, the mechanics, the, the workflows, the technical details seem to have been successfully exported by the EU. And this question of values of, uh, of um, ethics that's actually the really thorny one to solve. And that's going to take most of our efforts in the, in the years to come. Not, uh, not uh, how, how do uh, deep disagreements about how to provide cybersecurity for, for AI models. Yes, I totally agree with you on that front, Kevin. Like when you go to the specific, when you start to add substance to those procedures, when you start to think, well, what matters and what values are at stake, or even how do we materialize those values is where the, things begin to be, become even more complicated. And so even though we don't have a uh, regulation, this is not some pro problem that is gonna emerge just in the green darkness of the far future. This is something that's really present now. It's something that even though the, the shape of law, the precise requirements might change a, a bit or even much, given how much the political discussion is still up to grabs, we still have the opportunity, we have, still can see that there are gonna be already huge problems to tackle in terms of understanding values and bringing them into code and making our software systems in ways that can cope with those values and adapt when needed. And so this is why the procedural, getting the procedural, getting the idea that we can have to follow a certain practice, give, tracking how those practices and decisions are made throughout the entire life cycle of the systems. This is what, what becomes relevant. This is what can be started right now or even before even before any particular substance of the text. Because unless something completely different from what has been proposed so far in all those jurisdictions appears, the most of those procedural what concerns, concerns with fairness, concerns of with accuracy and development so on are still going to be relevant no matter the substance we are going to implement at the end of the day. But thank you for this fascinating discussion. <laughs> So can you share, can you see my screen? Okay, so thank you, Marco, and thank you, Kevin. And of course, thank you to all the participants. So if you would like to, to write an email to Kevin or Marco, you can find here uh, their emails. And uh, I think we are done for today. So I wish you a, a great evening.